I'm coming to the end of a stretch on my Peloton app, set to an all Beyonce soundtrack. I take a sip from my brightly colored hydro flask, which I bought because I saw so many influencers chugging out the same pastel vessel. I have certainly released all of my childhood trauma that so many instructors tell me builds up in my hips. <laughs> I have breathed in an intention to change what I can and breathed out the darkness of what I cannot. I have completed my weekly stretching streak, and as my instructor says to me, has anyone ever told you that you're incredibly beautiful and that's the least interesting thing about you? I shed a tear. I am a self-love goddess, subsisting on deep breaths, water from teal jugs, and clean foods. I see the good in the world, and I cherish it for the blessings it has bestowed upon me. But all this feels a bit foreign, a slight betrayal to my factory settings, as those settings are set to sad. <laughs> Some say you're born with it, others say you choose it. The way I look at it, I was born emo. <laughs> and at my core, I'm still emo. It's not a phase, mom. If you're only vaguely familiar with the music genre term lifestyle, or you're confusing it with goth, let me explain. I think emos get conflated with goths a lot. And please, don't get it twisted. I love goths. I have immense respect for my elders. <laughs> Having both written very bad poetry for the people we love, and cried during sex with them, Goths and emos have a lot in common, but there's a key difference between goth and emo. Goths' roots are in punk music, anti-establishment, anti-authority, and anti-mainstream. Goths want to be loved, sure, but they don't need to be liked. If you're emo, you want to be liked. <laughs> you want to be validated. Yes, no one understands me, but oh my fucking God, wouldn't it be great if they did? <laughs> Here's an example of that burning plea to be liked in, in lyrics from a Taking Back Sunday song. <laughs> the truth is, you could slit my throat, and with one last gasping breath, I'd apologize for bleeding on your shirt. <laughs> Thirsty! <laughs> my first hit of emo could not have come at a more perfect time. The year I started high school, there was a big snowstorm right before winter break. This resulted in a month of school being canceled. I think movies had made me think snow days were going to be fun, full of mischief and maybe some romance. These movies were also called Snow Day. <laughs> in reality, when you don't drive and you just started out of school where you aren't really that close with anyone, plus hormones, being snowed in when you're 14 is incredibly lonely. There's a reason they didn't make the movie Snow Month. My days consisted mostly of refreshing my MySpace page and listening to the songs posted on everyone else's. It was through this cycle I discovered Weezer's The Blue Album. I was playing it start to finish at least four times a day. Track three, The World Has Turned and Left Me Here. Thank you, thank you so much fellow emos. That song really hit. The world indeed had. I was inside my house with my dad watching Shallow Hell. <laughs> The rest of the world was out there, falling in love, making friends, and treating their depression. I was not. <laughs> Probably a huge reason why emo music resonated with me so much was the genre's recognition of a divide. The world is different than me because the world doesn't seem to wake up daily enveloped by a misery cocktail of dread, avoidance, and longing. There's an incredibly relatable, this is incredibly relatable during an already isolating time such as your teens. It's even more relatable when you have depression, but you don't know it's called that, and no one in the world around you believes it's real. So you play Weezer's Blue Album 17 more times. The snow melted that year, but my black heart did not. Over the years, I dyed my dark brown hair jet black just to show my commitment to the cause. I wore nothing but black. I only listened to bands whose song titles were more than seven words long. <laughs> and I fucking pined. 
The feeling of being alone is one of the most common themes in emo music, but there's another one that's even more alluring, sexual even. A through line in emo music is that once you find someone just as misunderstood as you, and you two fall in love, you must escape the chains of the small town you live in. <laughs> I refer to this theme as, let's get out of this town. They don't understand our love. <laughs> when I was 16, I was given an emo gift. I no longer had to imagine heartbreaks illustrated for me in songs because I had one of my own. My suffering was no longer unfounded and my dad could stop yelling, why do you play that music? Your life is great. Stop fucking crying. <laughs> We love our dads, right? <laughs> after listening to all this emo music, I hadn't lusted just after love, but the fallout as well. And hell hath no fury, like an emo who has been dumped. <laughs> and when I mean fury, I mean frequent crying and journaling. <laughs> Here's a journal entry from right around the time the breakup happened. Note that I write that I'm playing Elliot Smith. <laughs> Someone who even emo kids are like, damn, that's sad music. <laughs> okay, here it is. I don't know what's wrong with me. I feel like summer's dying young. I just keep getting really sad and crying. I don't know what over, but I'm sure it's subconscious loneliness becoming conscious. I miss love so much. Just that feeling you get. I don't miss anyone. Just miss that feeling a lot every day. Max is such a fucking douche. <laughs> this heartbreak was basically made in an emo lab. I made out with this guy, Max, for the first time at a Death Cab for Cutie concert. <laughs> During, I will follow you into the dark. <laughs> a song that is so emo that it takes a romance that's going well and turns it into a promise to haunt your lover long after they're dead. <laughs> Max was supposed to be my guy that I left with because the town didn't understand our love. But he left me for another girl with a boy's name and hair just like mine that was somehow both short on top but long on the bottom. <laughs> Though my eyeliner could not have been thicker and blacker in high school, I, like most people, took college as an opportunity to change who I was. This fatefully coincided with many emo bands going into hibernation. So I very much embraced the twee style of Zoe Deschanel. <laughs> Wearing fedoras and men's shirts as dresses. I only listened to bands like Vampire Weekend and Animal Collective, recommended to me by my coworkers at, where else, the college radio station. <laughs> Basically, my new persona was being annoying. <laughs> I majored in creative writing and was in an improv troupe, which means I got a certificate for my bad poetry and in my spare time was begging people to pay attention to me on stage. <laughs> Despite my best efforts, I stayed very emo during college. Plus, I was still furiously crying and journaling. I would switched from pen and paper to Tumblr. Here's one of the entries. <laughs> Looks like things were going well. <laughs> I hadn't found the misunderstood love of my life to run away with, so I ran away on my own, which I think is even more emo, if I do say so myself. <laughs> After college, I moved from my hometown of Reno, Nevada to San Francisco. And yeah, I found love several times <laughs> in the arms of addicts, manic depressives, and ex-punk band members. In emo terms, I had made it. <laughs> I even got to do stand-up as an opener for one of my favorite emo bands, Minus the Bear. I showed my respect for the band by doing what any emo person would do, by avoiding eye contact and nodding at them. <laughs> Eventually, though, I found love that didn't seem like it was written in a Taking Back Sunday song. And he was great, despite never even hearing of Minus the Bear. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> even when I found love and things in my life were going relatively well, something was missing. There's a sick desire within emo culture, and me, that lurks long after the pining has stopped. 
There's always a little bit of, a little bit of me that wears sad colored lenses, that even when the world seems to finally align with me, there's a part that prefers it dark, with headphones on, looking out the snow-covered hills and longing. Then it hit, the most emo time in recent history, 2020. <laughs> it was like the whole world had a snow week, then a snow month, then a snow two years. We could only see the people we loved and wait for it to get better. During the pandemic, I lost my job, I lost out on a lot of opportunities, and I lost people very close to me. I felt really lost. So, of course, I furiously cried and journaled. Here's my journal from 2020. It's in Google Docs, which shows the passage of time. <laughs> Lately, I've been wondering if social distance is just my preferred MO. I was an anxious teenager who has blossomed into an anxious adult, so I simply have a preference for a light house arrest. It's still so emo. <laughs> Like I said, there's a part of me that's always feeling for when the bottom is going to fall out. And when it did during the pandemic, I felt strangely at home. For once, I felt the world was ending and it actually was. Everyone was wearing the sad colored lenses. And I low-key thrived during the pandemic. The quickness with which I made an emo playlist on Spotify and played it over and over would make my 14-year-old self proud. I blasted sad songs, I cut my own bangs. But this time, my depression was treated. I have been on meds for four years. I cannot advertise them enough. Just take the drugs, guys. Now I get what my chemical romance is. It's me and my antidepressants. As for actual romance, I not only got engaged during 2020, but I got married during 2020. We actually had to run back to my hometown for the ceremony, which is kind of a reverse emo of running away because they don't understand our love. <laughs> but if getting married during the saddest time in recent history isn't the most emo romance, I don't know what is. When I was younger, being emo was looked upon as some self-indulgent act. That instead of just working through my problems, I was committing some crime against coping. But in reality, emo music was all I had. I didn't know who I was or why I felt so sad. But the raw and honest pain the lyrics expressed empowered me to feel okay expressing the same. In emo music, there is no such thing as too dramatic. There is only more cathartic. Though you may experience highs, emo music lives at an all-time low. <laughs> One that you can always revisit when you feel invisible to feel seen. These days, I go to therapy, I take meds, I have a self-care ritual, complete with Peloton sweat sets. Taylor Swift yoga routines, and hydro flasks. And sure, it all works fine. But honestly, putting on Weezer's The Blue Album does the trick just the same. Thank you. Sam DeSalvo!